Good morning. Today is the second Sunday in Lent, February 28th, 2021. Participating in today's service, Lector Carol McFall, the duet Jerry and Sandy Rechtenwald, Sunday organist Anne Long, video photographer Shane Donnelly. The Sarah's Easter Candy order deadline is the 5th of March. A weekly letter will go out tomorrow. Hope you're having a good day and we'll see you next weekend. Oh, sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown how pale thou art with anguish with sore abuse and scorn how does that visage languish which once was bright as morn what thou my lord hast suffered was all for sinners gain mine mine was the transgression and girls. In a few weeks the church will be decorated for Easter and I've already been looking through some of the decorations and I make miniature scenes related to Jesus suffering and death on the cross, his burial in the tomb and here I have this hill and the cross and a couple other pieces that go with my set there are two other crosses. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus was condemned by the governor Pilate and ordered to be put to death on the cross, that he was joined by two other men. And they were robbers. They were thieves. And the Bible does not tell us their names. We don't know who they, who they were. And we're also told that when the three men were nailed on the cross, that Jesus was in the middle. All right, that we know for sure. Now, what, what can we, we learn from this story? Now, Jesus was condemned, and Jesus was ordered to be put to death, and he was innocent. Jesus did nothing wrong, and we are reminded that sometimes innocent people suffered. I'm, I'm gonna ask you, has there ever been a time when somebody lied about you or you got in trouble for something that you did not do? You, you were condemned. Some, somebody said that you did something, but you didn't do it, but you, you were blamed for it. How did you feel? You, you, you didn't like that. I'm certain. All right, so, so maybe you were put in the corner. Maybe you were yelled at. 
Um, and maybe you were hit with a spoon, um, you were sent to your room. Yeah, you, so there, there was a punishment, but it should not have been. And you were innocent. So when you have that feeling, Jesus understands because he was really badly mistreated and he was innocent. But there's a, another lesson here too. These two men who died with, with Jesus, they really were guilty. They, were, they did bad stuff. Now, we don't know if they robbed banks. We don't know if they were a pickpocket and they were sneaking up on, on people and stealing their purses. We, we don't, and we don't know how many times that they robbed, but they got caught, and they were in big trouble. And, and I hope that that's something that we always remember. God has given a commandment binding on everybody. You are not to steal. It is never acceptable for us to take things that don't belong to us. And they thought they were going to get away with it, but they didn't and they got caught. All right, so this is a reminder to us that we are to respect the property of other people. And I, and I hope, have you, have you ever had anybody take something from you that you, you don't like? I know that I have. I've had people steal from me. It's not good. All right, so here's another lesson that we learned from the three crosses on, on the hill. Now in Newcastle, we have the North Hill, and we have Sheep Hill. Well, in the Bible, they had a hill outside Jerusalem. And the Bible calls it the Hill Calvary. It's also called Golgotha. All right, so this is where these three men were put to death. Now, also we learn Jesus was talking to these two thieves. It was very difficult with his suffering that he could talk, but to the one thief on Jesus' right, the man was really sorry for what he did. He, he did a lot of bad stuff. But at the last minute, he looked at Jesus and he, 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 he didn't want to be, he didn't want to die unforgiven. And he looked at Jesus and said, do you think God could forgive me all the things that I've done? I'm really sorry. If I had my life to do over, I would have made changes. And Jesus said, for sure, I can tell you, God forgives you. And that when you die, that you're not going to be punished. You're going to be able to go to heaven. But the other man, he didn't want to hear any of this. He, he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe in heaven. He said, I don't have anything to do with it. So here's another lesson that it's never too late for people to change their ways. And maybe we know people who do things that they shouldn't be doing. They're, they're wrong. With the things they're doing are bad. But the hope here is that even at the last minute, that people can change and they can ask God for forgiveness and God will forgive them. All right, so there's valuable lessons that even while Jesus is dying on the cross, that we can learn and we hear these stories this time of year with Easter and your gift today as a reminder to you and you can read this in your Bible the three crosses of Calvary that's what I'm giving you and you have the three crosses and I hope that you enjoy them maybe when you give Easter gifts you could give this as a gift to someone and tell them about Jesus and the two robbers. You have a good day, and it's good that you're with us. Verses from the Gospels related to Christ's call to discipleship. Matthew chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. 
What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Chapter 14, verses 25 and 27. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. All the readings are from the New International Version Bible. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Known as the chaplain of Sunset Strip, Baptist preacher Arthur Blessed in the 1960s was in the national spotlight for his outreach to the Hells Angels, the Hippies, and the Hollywood Stars. Seeking to expand his ministry, Blessed removed a large wooden cross from the wall of his place, Coffee House, and proposed to carry it from coast to coast, Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. Since this initial walk on Christmas Day of 1968, Arthur Blessed has carried the same cross all over the globe, stepping foot on every continent, including Antarctica. He came through our area in the early 1980s. The Guinness Book of World Records has awarded Blessed the recognition of the greatest documented lifetime mileage walker, having walked 43,340 miles in 342 countries island groups and territories. Now at age 80, Blessed continues his unique style of evangelism, a lot of publicity anticipating his arrival. He sets up a cross at the rally, inviting the gathering to embrace the plan of salvation and for these newcomers to the faith to take up a cross and to follow Jesus. With a use of an object lesson, Arthur Blessed has sought to get the word out that Christ died on a cross for our sins, that Christianity is not easy believism, but a radical call for each of us to carry a cross. Keep in mind, Blessed has a unique contraption. His six feet by 10 feet, 80 pound cross has wheels at its foot for navigating on his shoulder along the highways. The mod minister is to be applauded for stressing the primacy of Christ's completed work of redemption on the cross, but also his summons for his followers to carry a cross. Knowing that a crucifixion awaited him in Jerusalem, on three occasions, our good Lord informed his leadership team of his impending passion. And with these prophecies, our good Lord issued his call to discipleship. 
If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. A disciple is a student or a learner, not simply seated at the feet of the master, soaking up his teachings. Greater still, to be a disciple carries the connotation of an apprentice with on-the-job training in the field under a mentor. The cross is a symbol of death. Wearing a cross as jewelry can be likened to decorating one's son, oneself with a miniature electric chair. Condemned criminals like Jesus and the two thieves were compelled to carry their own instrument of death to the site of execution. To carry a cross conveys a death march. The Savior Jesus Christ carried a torture stake from the courtyard of Pilate to the hill called Calvary, a short distance. The proclamation here is for us to carry our cross each and every day of our lives. Luke alone includes daily bearing of the cross. Discipleship is a 24-7 consecration, not an activity restricted to Sundays in a house of prayer. By forcing a condemned criminal to carry his cross, the Roman officer exerted total control as to the last hours of the man sentenced to be crucified by the death squad. Bearing a cross is a control issue. Who's the boss? A.W. Tozer is likely the most gifted Bible expositor to come out of the Christian Missionary Alliance. I commend him to your reading. Speaking on this passage, Tozer brought to our attention, if we are following Christ, we can only be facing one direction. There is no going back. And we have turned over all sense of future plans of our own for the final outcome to be determined by him. Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase of the Bible, entitled The Message, communicates the underlying meaning of the passages of the call of discipleship. Anyone who intends to come to me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself and your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? The Lenten banners on the altar include the embroidered letters IHS, which can be interpreted in his steps. To follow implies that we must be moving in the same direction, walking in Christ's steps. Jesus did not say, join the convoy and follow people who follow people who follow people who follow me. The master challenge, follow me. Do we have our focus on Christ? The direction we take, the course we follow, and the orders we conform have been authorized by the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Our good Lord did not make his cross. It was made for him. So the circumstances of our lives have determined the construction of our cross. Christ did not say, take up his cross, but take up your cross. My cross is not the same as yours, and yours is not the same as mine. Crosses are custom designed that fit our shoulder and the blades of no one else. Poor health, a bad job, or a troublesome marriage may be the cross laid on our back. Jesus said we are to take up our cross 
not drag it. If we are truly following Christ, we view life differently. The alcoholic spouse, the physical handicap, the irritating situation at the workplace, being cheated out of a will, and the out-of-control prodigal son or daughter are approached with a new perspective. WWJD, what would Jesus do? How do we bear our cross? Scripturally, prayerfully, responsibly. We are to follow Christ because he walks ahead. He is providing an example and stands near at hand with us as an encouragement, a guide, and a disciplinarian. Suffering is mandatory. Misery is optional. A man had a dream at the end of his rope, groaned in distress as to his difficulties. Lord, I just can't take any more of this. My cross is too heavy to bear. Jesus replied with compassion, My son, if you can't stand up under its weight, come to my cross workshop and you can exchange it for any other in the lot. Taking him to a giant warehouse with many different crosses of various sizes, styles, and weights, the Lord told him, go ahead and take your pick. Filled with relief, the young man sighed, and he entered the heavenly workshop of crosses, tossing his own in the corner and searching for one he would rather carry. Some were so high they toppled over by an attempted lift and others were so heavy he could not even budge them. Spotting one in the corner, it seemed to be a lightweight. He whispered, Lord, I like this one. Jesus had a big smile. Son, that is the cross you brought in with you. Wrongly, we whine that other people's crosses are lighter than our own. With whom do you want to trade places? Helen Steiner Rice was a popular inspirational writer of an earlier generation. Her poem entitled, Is the Cross You Wear Too Heavy the Bear? So never complain about your cross, for your cross has been blessed. God made it just for you to wear, and remember, God knows best. One of the most profound paradoxes in the greatest story ever told is to be discovered in the Passion narrative. The grand teacher issued the call that every man must carry his own cross. But when the one making the, the demand carried his own cross down the Via Della Rosa, he collapsed under its weight with Simon of Cyrene enlisted from the crowd of onlookers to pick it up for the Lord. There is a lesson here, that when we are burdened by the enormity of our cross, too heavy for us to take another step, the Heavenly Father will put someone in our path to help us to bear the string. Can it be that the Heavenly Father seeks for us to use our personal cross and past experience of pain to reach out to others undergoing a similar hardship and that we will minister to them to persevere in their tribulation? First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, with a husband in a wheelchair, became very adept at answering questions tossed at her when making public addresses. When in nearby Akron, Ohio, a hostile member of the audience fired at the wife of FDR. Do you think your husband's illness has affected his mentality? And calmly, Mrs. Roosevelt said, I am glad that you asked that question. The answer is yes. Anyone who has gone through a great suffering is bound to have a greater sympathy and understanding of the problems of mankind. 
and the crowd applauded her loudly. Dr. Robert Schuller of the Crystal Cathedral told us that the cross is a minus sign turned into a plus, and that God takes the cross in our life and turns it around to become a key to unlock a new door of opportunity. The carry the cross can be interpreted that we are to handle our personal suffering in such a way that it honors the Lord. To take up a cross and follow Jesus may bring persecution and martyrdom. Clarence Jordan, the author of the Cotton Patch Gospel, was given a red carpet tour of another minister's new monumental worship center. With pride, the pastor of the mega church pointed to the elegant decor, the state of art, high tech sound equipment, and the imported furniture. As they stepped outside, darkness was falling, and a spotlight shone on a huge cross atop the steeple. That cross alone cost us $10,000, remarked the preacher with a smile. And Jordan commented, you got cheated. 2,000 years ago, times were when Christians could get one for free. For an individual to be required to lay down his or her life because of a profession of faith in Jesus Christ sounds far-fetched and remote to us. When the Master spoke these words, North Americans were not his only audience or even a primary target group. As we assemble here, relatively free of governmental intrusion and reprisal, hundreds of millions of our brothers and sisters in the Lord in third world countries are forced to deal with discrimination loss of jobs and employment opportunities, the destruction of their homes and worship sites, and even extermination. Watchdog organizations like Open Doors and Voice of the Martyrs keep their pulse on anti-Christian activities overseas. As I speak, one in eight Christians worldwide finds himself in a nation where his profession of Christian faith puts him at risk. When this statistic is applied to the continent of Africa, one in six Christians faces endangerment, and in Asia, two out of five. Social groups and state-sponsored hostility towards Christians can be gauged by unfolding degrees. Disapproval, ridicule, pressure to conform, loss of educational opportunities, economic sanctions, shunning, alienation from the community, loss of employment, loss of property, physical abuse, mob violence, harassment by officials, kidnapping, forced labor, imprisonment, physical torture, murder, or execution. As expected, North Korea is the most suppressive of all nations towards the Christian population. Major campaigns of destruction and death are mounting in northern Nigeria and in Ethiopia. Do we ever take thought of our brothers and sisters in the family of God who are laying down their lives with the Lord Jesus. Do we remember them in prayer? Nathan Hale, a patriot for the cause of American independence, was captured by the British and hanged as a spy. Hale's last words were, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. And what about us? Not every Christian will be called upon to die as a martyr. 
but every disciple is commanded to be willing to be martyred. If we are willing to lay down our lives as a Christian, will we not also seek to live a life which is well-pleasing unto the Lord? If we are to take up a cross daily and follow Jesus, the necessity is to enable us for this to happen is by the denial of the self. Matthew Henry, in his devotional commentary on the Bible, wrote, The first lesson in Christ's school is self-denial. Christians deny themselves candy for Lent, or forego amusements like going to the movies, or eliminate smoking cigarettes. And there is some merit for these disciplines, but they are only for six weeks. Use deny as St. Peter denied Christ three times before the rooster crowed. When Peter denied deny Jesus, he renounced or disowned all connection with the Son of God. The denial of self is a process that our thinking, our speaking, and our actions are in harmony with those of Jesus Christ. So we renounce, we disown our old ways, and we embrace the ways of Christ. There is a big disconnect in the American church. The majority of the population identifying themselves as Christians find that the profession has not been carried over into practice. Confession does not inform conduct, and beliefs have not been translated into behavior. President Jimmy Carter said that a turning point in his life was a message which produced disturbance. If you were to stand in a courtroom and tried for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And he said he didn't think there was. And that brought about a reformation in his Christian life. J.C. Ryle, the 19th century Church of England Bishop of Liverpool, in his commentary made this assessment. We must not conceal from ourselves that true Christianity brings with it a daily cross in this life. While it offers us a crown of glory in the life to come, the flesh must be daily crucified, the devil must be daily resisted, and the world must be daily overcome. There is a warfare to be waged and a battle to be fought. This three-front battle, the world, the flesh, and the devil, it appears that the other side is winning because most confessing Christians are not carrying a cross, saying no to the self, and yes, the following Jesus. Our culture ex extols the importance of self-gratification, self-fulfillment, self-assertion, self-betterment, and self-deification, the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Shaking hands with the congregation at the front door following a church service, the pastor grabbed a chap seldom to darken the house of God and pulled him aside and whispered, You need to join the army of the Lord. Reverend, I am already in the army of the Lord. The preacher commented, How can that be? I only see you at Christmas and Easter. What army are you in? I'm in the secret service. We have too many secret Christians. We, we need to be a more bold witness. The cross is the pain involved in bringing our attitudes, our thought life, 
our beliefs and our actions into conformity with the expectations of Jesus Christ. Being a disciple of Christ, we are to bring the entirety of our life into submission to his heart, his mind, and his spirit. Conduct unbecoming an officer is a term used in the military to cover anything from minor offenses resulting in a reprimand to a major one requiring a court-martial. But the expression is more than a description of unacceptable behavior. It is a statement that the conduct is inconsistent with that expected from a U.S. military officer. The officer failed to live up to his or her commitment to act as an officer should act. And if we are in the Lord's army, should not a Christian have at least similar expectations? Conduct unbecoming to a Christian when we are impatient, show anger, speak racist words, when we display violence, our conduct is unchristlike. A number of hymns owe their popularity to the promotion by the ministry of the late Billy Graham. Just as I am, how great thou art, his eye is on the sparrow to name a few. On this list add, I have decided to follow Jesus. In 1959, the Billy Graham Crusades introduced this 19th century song from India to Americans. The lyrics reflect the reality of a situation. An Indian convert to Christ confronted great opposition. He found himself in the midst of a hostile majority, but his decision would never be altered. And though none go with me, I still will follow. And what about you? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good Jesus, who bore the cross for me, what cross is it your will that I should bear for you? You know, Lord, that I am all weakness. Teach me to bear my cross. Bear it for me. Bear it in me. Amen. Please join me for the unison prayer. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.